entire Adishar Dam. But actually, in reflecting on that subject, it seemed to me just a question as to whether to cover those two men I would need a seminar of six months or a seminar of a year, because the material in both their works is so large and so full of implications. But what I would like to do tonight does not have to do with the actual content of their work as much as with the nature of their lives in relation to their work, and particularly from the point of view of a method or a way of approach to the study of persons. So that what I would like to cover in my talking part tonight is something of the way of understanding the inner myth of these men and in such a way that we can get a feeling of how their lives opened out, how the tensions were there, how the transitions were there, and in order that we can see how the movement took place from within and how we can draw from that a certain sense and perspective for a psychological approach as a whole to the development of personality. But in addition, and just in addition, that we would be able to see in this not only their personal development, but how it is that apparently in the development of persons there is a kind of overlay. That is, an individual lives out his private life and develops the possibilities of his own personality, but in doing that, he also lives out certain social or historical facts, certain social developments, and expresses certain social factors in his life. And then beyond that, lives out something through his personal life that is even more than personal, that is transpersonal in the sense that what a person achieves in his individual life seems to have an effect for the society as a whole and in some way for man as a whole. That is to say, it's as though a person lives out a kind of destiny through his private or his personal life that is a carrier of something that has a meaning beyond his own private destiny. And that makes certain individuals of particular significance. It makes them, I think, in one sense that both Tayard and, and C.G. Jung can be called particularly modern men. That is to say, they're modern men not only in the sense that they happen to live in this modern period of history, but they are modern men in the special sense that the problems that express the quality of modern existence, the questions of science, and the questions where traditional religion have come into conflict and into doubt, that this area of question that is peculiarly a question and a problem for modern Western civilization was lived out really at the core of their lives and became for both of them, both Jung and Teilhard de Chardin, this kind of special modern question became a very intimate personal problem, an intimate personal question for them. So that what we find in persons of this kind is that somehow this kind of person can't really have a personal life that is satisfying unless he has engaged himself fully in questions that are of a more than personal nature. This is true of Teilhard de Chardin and Jung and gives them, I think, a special kind of significance from a psychological point of view. And in this additional way that it seems to me important for us working in psychology to keep this perspective that the meaning of a person's life and the success of a person's individual development is not merely a question of how harmonious or how successful he can make his life in relation to his immediate environment. And within the specific bounds of his life, that is the conception in much of the psychotherapy we're accustomed to is that if we can make a person able to function 
and to be reasonably socially successful within the bounds of his life, that this is a satisfactory and sufficient measure. I think we want to be able here to keep in mind that a, the meaning, even in a larger sense, the success of a person's life, extends beyond the nature of his actual living years, his mortal life, and especially that a person at a certain kind of development has this awareness really very deeply working in the nature of his life. This is something we'd find in both Jung and Chardin. I want to make, before we begin to talk about them though, a few remarks about the overarching conception of studying individuals in terms of transitions. I think there's one basic point to see about the nature of human beings as contrasted to all the rest of the species in evolution. And this is that all the other species in the world of nature have a certain possibility of life and of growth. And this growth takes place in every species, one could say automatically. That is to say, each animal species fulfills its possibility and does the things that are native and instinctive to it insofar as its life development grows and it fulfills itself. But in the human species, we see that the process of growth that would fulfill the possibilities of the individual is not automatic. In the human species, it depends upon a particular experience in the individual. And this is specifically what has been called, when we study primitive cultures, has been called initiation experience. That is to say that the development of the possibilities of an individual depends on some particular experience that comes to him that enables him to experience his own individuality in a particular and personal way. Before such an experience happens, it's as though he's just part of the world and life is not specific and has no identity for him. When that experience happens, and it may be that not one experience is enough, but when that experience happens, then it is that the things that have happened in the world to him, events that happen to the individual, are no longer just events that happen to which he reacts. But then it's as though outer experience comes into him and he has a sense of his own identity then as a specific force, a specific kind of transforming force, so that what comes into the individual's life then goes out of him with his particular stamp upon it. And as he becomes aware that of the nature of this stamp, and even if he's not aware of the nature of it, as he's aware of the fact that it is there, that his being transforms events that have happened to him, and that life goes out of him in a different way than in it came. When he has that experience, he has the sense that he exists and that from that point on his life has a meaning in the very particular way that his life has a meaning that is continuing and is opening out because his identity, his existence, begins to make that possible. Now therefore, it seems to me that in studying the life of persons who can be called creative persons, and I should say that what I understand by that phrase is not that necessarily that a person has done things that are famous in the world, but rather a person whose life contains a great deal of experience. A person whose life has in it first this quality of experience, that his identity has happened. He has been, so to say, initiated. And then, with that basic fact of his identity, that then as experience comes in to him, 
and goes out again transformed with the ever-growing, the ever-enlarging quality of his identity. And that's really the basic fact, the basic creative fact. The creativity is in the quality of person then. It's in the fact that once this basic experience of identity has happened, the experiences that follow are all the making of something new, not only in the way that they go back out to the world to other people, but that something new is constantly being made, constantly being created in this quality of the experience.